This program was made possible by a generous grant from the Parker Foundation. Gerald and Inez Parker. Romance of the Ranchos. The words bring images perpetuated in song and film of happy times, of fiestas, of caballeros dressed in outfits trimmed in silver, and their ladies twirling around a dance floor in long dresses with swirling skirts. Certainly there was that. But there were also long hours of tedious work. 300 Native Americans helped build Rancho Guajome. And there were also reports of a leading ranchero getting away with murder. At one adobe, modern visitors swear they've heard ghosts. These rancheros of North San Diego County were pioneers who lived off the land via cattle, crops, and their strength of character. After Mexico's successful revolution from Spain culminated in 1821, Mexican governors in California began distributing land grants, some of them huge, like the giant 133,000-acre Rancho Santa Margarita y Las Flores, most of which is now one of the largest Marine Corps bases in the world. And some of them were small, down now to only a few acres. Movie stars of their times played bit to major roles in the ranchos. Joan Crawford donated the big tree in the courtyard at Buena Vista, and Charlie Chaplin visited. It was owned by Margarita Fisher, a big star in silent films, and her husband, Harry Pollard, a Hollywood director. And Leo Carrillo, of Cisco Kid television fame, owned his own rancho, reflecting the heritage of his ranchero forebears. Some of the ranchos, Guajome, Buena Vista, and Carrillo, are in public ownership with tours on a regular basis. Others, like those on the Marine Base, still allow the public, but on a more restricted basis. Some owners, like Shelley Caron, schedule regular school groups to view her Maron Adobe, and others, like Pat and Karen Kelly on portions of the old Rancho Agua Edionda, still revere the adobe, part of their own private home. Much of the ranch land, including most of the current city of Carlsbad and property that was once owned by Oceanside City Councilman John Steiger, have given way to modern development. In this series, KOCT remembers the adobes and ranchos of early California. Rancho Wahome, in its rural setting, looks as if it had come down to us from olden days. Its grounds and 7,200 square foot home are owned by the County of San Diego. Like its neighbor, Rancho Buena Vista, it was owned by Cave Kautz, who is said to have gotten away with murder. Kautz and his wife Isadora Bandini received the rancho as a wedding present. In early 1990, the late Bill Kautz a direct descendant of the adobe's historic owner, was interviewed at Rancho Wahome for his KOCT's documentary, Wahome, Cadillac of the Adobes. The late Mary Ward, longtime San Diego County historian, also was interviewed in 1990 at Rancho Wahome. Rancho Wahome became known as the social and cultural center of North County and had a school, a church, and a store on the premises. Store prices included 18 bears of stirrups or three ax blades for $18, 100 pounds of sugar sold for $10, and 75 pounds of coffee for $15. A list of annual wages paid showed that a doctor, Jesus Ortega, MD, received the most money, $360 for the year. Jake Enriquez, District Manager for the San Diego County Department of Parks and Recreation, which owns the rancho, tells us about the Kautz family and life at Wahome, 
The name, incidentally, is Duiseño, Indian, for frog pond. Hi, my name is Jake Enriquez. I'm a district manager with the County of San Diego Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Rancho Guajome was built by Cave Johnson Counts, a native of Tennessee and a graduate of West Point. He came out to California in 1849. In 1851, he married Isadora Bandini, and together in 1852, they started construction on this home. My name is Mary Ward. I am the historian um, with the uh, County of San Diego Department of Parks and Recreation. So Kautz was invited to stay in the home of his future father-in-law, Juan Bandini. And from what I understand, there were fiestas that went on continuously during that month uh, while they waited for the Mexican commissioners. And that was the occasion when he met his future wife, Isadora Bandini. He married Isadora in 1851 and then came up here, left Isadora uh, with her family in the Bandini house in Old Town and Kautz dragged some boards and brought his horse and came up here to this rich land and dug a well for water for his horse and for himself and virtually camped here until he began the construction in 1851 of the beginning of this um, beautiful adobe which is now called the Cadillac of adobes. Shortly after moving into Rancho Guajome, Kautz became very familiar with the area and within a short time he purchased the neighboring rancho, Rancho Buena Vista. A short time after that, he bought the next ranch over, which is Rancho Vallecitos de San Marcos, which is the city of San Marcos today. So from the western edge of Escondido, all the way along the 78 corridor into Oceanside, Kautz became a huge land baron and owned all the desirable land of the time, land that was good for agriculture and livestock. Something that's nice about Rancho Guajome is that it's ample supply of water. Guajome Creek runs out of the community of Vista, grows right through the entire property, and there's a couple of ponds along the way, and it's all marsh land full of lots of water, which made it conducive to a wide variety of agriculture. And even in dry years, he was able to dry farm because the water table stayed pretty moist around this area. Kautz built a, a one room initially, and then as an extension of that construction, he continued to the north and built the second room. And it was, um, I think he had three rooms completed when he wrote in his journal that he moved the family up from Old Town. And that would have been Isadora and the two oldest children, Abel Stearns Couts and Maria Antonia Couts. When the Couts family moved in, they had two small children, they had another one on the way. And over the course of the next 10 years, they had a total of 10 children. Two of them uh, passed away, but the others lived on to uh, be adults and have large families of their own. Now they lived in the three rooms, and he at that time had the entire structure enclosed with a wall. and. Then the next part of the adobe he began to develop was the southwest area of three rooms and a mercantile store, which he stocked with supplies that were needed by the neighboring ranch, rancheros and by Kautz's um, employees. Life on the rancho here was very exciting. You had a store here, you had a schoolhouse, you had a busy, active farm and uh, livestock operation going here. And with 10 children, many servants, there were plenty of people around. There was always a buzz of excitement. The Couts were known for being uh, gracious hosts and they loved to entertain and have parties and people pass by and meet strangers and have people just stop in on their way to another destination. And there are many accounts uh, describing the, the activity and the, the ambiance of the house. 
not only the, the colors from the blooming plants, orange blossoms, the creaking of the floor, the running, the sound of children, the sound of horses, carriages being hitched up and taking off. It was just a buzz of activity. And it really became kind of a city of its own. And there were other neighboring ranchos, but Rancho Guajome was very large and very active. And from uh, San Juan Capistrano to San Diego, this was considered a common stopping point because there was so much here. But after I was married, I, my wife and I came out here because they were shooting the picture to see it. In fact, people from all around come out here and was watching it. And I remember the, because he still once in a while I see him in, in the movement. Bobby Steele was the lead man in, in the woman. And they stayed drunk the entire time they were here. Well, they had a dance scene in this courtyard. I guess a fiesta-like deal. And we were watching, and they asked Georgia and I, my wife, they asked uh, if we wanted to dance in a dance in a, a dance scene, a waltz. And they said, we'll pay you $20. Well, $20 in those days was quite a bit of money. Sure, we'd dance. And I saw the picture, and you can see here, Georgia and I dancing in it. Helen Hunt Jackson had stayed here um, about 1884 when she was officially Commissioner of Indian Affairs and was gathering information for her government report on the treatment of the Native Americans in this area. She completed her report and then published her famous book, Ramona. She also stayed at some of the other neighboring ranchos, including Buena Vista and Rancho Montserrat, which today is Fallbrook. And she visited places like San Pasqual Valley and Palma Valley. And she gathered a lot of information and saw many things that were woven into the novel Ramona. And some of the exact names of places in San Diego County are incorporated into her story. So it was definitely an inspiration for her. And she stayed right here. There was one regular visitor who came and who also kept a journal and gave us a wonderful background on um, the daily activities here at the Rancho between 1858 and 1868. His name was uh, Judge Benjamin Hayes and he brought his son with him. He was a widowed gentleman and uh, brought his son Chauncey with him every time he came and Chauncey was the same age as Cape Cout's uh, junior so the boys uh, uh, would would play together and became good close fast friends and Judge Hayes would always bring marbles to uh, Cape Cout's junior and the boys used to play marbles out here on this covered porch. And as we have done our investigation in preparation for rehabilitation of the adobe, uh, we have found marbles here and there. In 1865, uh, Couts was indicted for the killing of an ex-employee. His name was Juan Mendoza. It was a foggy morning in 1865 in what is we call today Old Town San Diego. Couts had gone down early in the morning to take care of some business, and see the butcher Mr. Tibbetts, and across the way he saw an ex-employee who had, the last time they'd seen each other, threatened to take Couts' life. Well back in those days that basically meant all bets were off. And upon seeing Mr. Mendoza, Couts paced towards him, pulled out his double barrel shotgun, drew on him, and fired both blasts, one of them catching Mendoza in the back. Mendoza fell to the ground dead. Couts was indicted for that. Fortunately, at the time, Mr. Mendoza was not armed. But he was wearing a poncho. Couts couldn't see that. Couts was indicted for that. There was a trial, and he was, dis, uh, he was acquitted on a technicality for one of the jurors not being an American citizen. Well, here in the covered porch, this was added in 1896. At this time, Cave Couch Sr. has passed away, and his son, Cave Couch Jr., is now, so to speak, the man of the house. He's living here with his mom, Isadora, and his new wife, Lily Bell Clemens. Cave Couch Jr. grew up and married Lily Bell Clemens, who was the niece of Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. Cave Jr. brought his bride up here, and um, 
he did a, a remodel to make a comfortable apartment for mother, Isadora. He enclosed this covered porch so that his mom could move from one side of the adobe without having to go outside. She would be cool in the summer and, of course, dry and warm in the winter. He also built the sewing room above us for his wife, Lily Bell, where she could entertain, sew, and a beautiful view up there, a nice breeze, and just a nice place to spend a portion of the day. Couts then romanticized much of what he remembered in growing up here and um, sat back in his easy chair and threw the doors wide open, welcomed all of the famous visitors and called himself the last of the Dodes. In the early 70s, the County of San Diego embarked on acquiring the Guajome Parklands. Included in the Guajome Parklands was the Rancho Guajome or the Couts Hacienda. Because of the state, regional, and national significance of the history captured in this structure, it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, so it's basically a state national historic landmark. And because of that, and because of the quality of the habitat and the parkland, all of this land and the adobe were acquired to become what are today the Guajome Parks, Rancho Guajome Adobe and Guajome Regional Park in Oceanside. Today there are 394 acres of Guajome Parkland. The original land grant was 2,219 acres, so we've acquired a little less than a quarter of it, but still a very large park, with nice open trails, beautiful habitat, and connectivity all the way around us to the community. The County of San Diego bought the property directly from the descendants uh, of the Couts family. The descendants still live in San Diego County today, many of them do, and, and throughout Southern California. And after acquiring the property, the county basically embarked on a 20-year process to work towards restoration, doing the research, paint samples, wall samples, historic research. And it wasn't until the end of the 1980s that the first restoration happened here at Rancho Guajome, and that was with the Guajome Chapel was first restored. That was 1989. In the mid-90s, the North Kitchen Room was restored. And about 1996, the beginnings of the whole Hacienda restoration took place. And that was a long project and went on throughout the whole year, and it wasn't completed until the end of 1996. And what we're trying to do here at Rancho Guajome is replicate the Couts home. Let's say you've stopped by to visit them for a while. Unfortunately, they've gone off to San Diego or Los Angeles for the weekend. They're not here, but you can come in, you can see the rooms, you can see their belongings, you can get a feel for how they lived here in the mid-1800s. It's a little bit of rustic California, but also because they were a family of means, they could bring those nicer things in life to make the ranch as, as comfortable as possible for their family and for their guests. Moving forward, an adobe building is a type of building that just constantly has to be taken care of. We generally describe it as low tech, but high frequency. You constantly have to be after it. So the couple of improvements we have is stabilizing the adobe walls and of course keeping a solid roof on, the, on any adobe structure is the key. If you can keep the rain off the building, it'll last forever. Rancho Guajome is available for regular tours, school tours, it's also a wonderful wedding venue. We have over 40 weddings here a year. It's just a beautiful setting, it's a unique setting. Every customer uses the property in a little different way. Mary Lou Beltran, whose great-great-grandmother was a servant in the Couch household at Rancho Guajome, talks about life at the time from a Native American perspective. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Beltran, and I'm a Lucenia from this area. My descendants were from the tribe that lived on the Wahomey village, and my grandmother was born there in 1875. She was raised there by her grandmother because she lost her mother and her 13 siblings when the smallpox uh, epidemic was going on. So my grandmother grew up here in that village and her grandmother was working here as a servant in the rancho and um, she just grew up working here also and she worked here all her life and 
when she got old enough, she had her own little ranch, and it was um, just a little ways away from here, but she would come in the buckboard every day to work here at the Wahomey Ranch. And she stayed a servant, and she was here till, I guess, till she couldn't work anymore. But um, she would do the linens. She was a servant, and she would do the linens and cook and dishwashing, anything that had to be done. You know, that was her job. This used to be um, a stop-off place between people uh, that were traveling between San Diego and. LA or wherever to different destinations and the Couts were very hospitable they always had guests that would be staying and, and they would be entertaining and so one of my grandmother's jobs was to take the linens home um, the sheets or uh, tablecloths or whatever it was her job to take those home and do the laundry and then bring them back and so on her little ranch she had this stream that would go through her ranch and down by the water, she had these big aluminum tubs set up on rocks and she would build fires under them and she would um, make, put the, boil, boil the water and she took these, I call them coyote gourds and she would cut them and throw them in, they would act as bleach and so she would put the sheets and the, all her linens and stuff in there and wash them and hang them up and dry them and, and uh, then she had to iron them, and she'd have uh, these buck, these sawhorses with uh, planks of boards on them, and her things laid out. And she'd had, I remember she had a whole collection, different sizes of these little steel irons that you would heat on the wood stove. <laughs> and she'd have her wood stove, you know, the, her irons on them. My mom says, and she'd heat them, you know. And I used to think, how didn't she not burn them, you know? Because <laughs> with electric iron, I could burn something. <laughs> My mother would tell us that uh, the Native American help here at the rancho weren't treated very well, that they, they were very strictly watched and ordered to do stuff, you know, and, and they had to do what they had to do. If they didn't, they were punished. Um, uh, one such case was um, these two uh, Native boys, I mean, there was partying and things going on here at the rancho and they could smell all this food and stuff cooking, you know, and they were hungry. And so they took it upon themselves to steal a head of cattle so they could, you know, eat. <laughs> and Mr. Couts found out about it. And so to make a, a point to everybody else, he had them tied to the pepper tree that's in the courtyard. And it wasn't just them, it was kind of known as the punishment tree. Whenever a Native American or anybody got in trouble with them and had needed to be punished, they were tied with their arms around that tree and then they were whipped. And anyway, this one time, they, he whipped those two men until they were dead, they, they killed them. And, uh, but anyway, she would say that everybody, you know, they knew to be careful to, you know, stay away from that, you know, be what they had to do or they were going to end up by the tree. And she says that her mother would tell her that the tree would be like slick with the oil from the bodies, you know, of the uh, native people that had been tied to it, you know. But, and the tree is still there. <laughs> it's getting older looking, but it's still there. And um, Isadora, she was also very, very strict and very, she, everything had to be like just right and and she everybody had to stay in their place and and one case in point in that was when the author uh, Helen Hunt Jackson came to do a, to do a story here on the Native Americans um, she really didn't like her being that close associating with the native people and the the end result of that was that they were going to church one day and uh, they, they, I guess Helen was talking with these group of native people and they all went into the church and she told them to go ahead and sit, you know, to sit down, you know, because they, they knew they shouldn't, but she told me oh, it was okay, go ahead and sit down. So they did 
and anyway, when Isadora came in to go to church, she seen that they were sitting in her place, and she got very angry and very upset, and she told Helen Hunt Jackson that she wanted her to leave the next day, and so that was what she did. She was gonna make her leave the next day, and to make sure that she didn't have any more contact with the native people, she took her to her room and locked her in until the next day when she left. <laughs> So they were kind of strict, but I could think if you did your work and minded your P's and Q's, you were okay. <laughs> Otherwise, my grandmother probably wouldn't have lasted there so long. <laughs> It's been many years later since, uh, you know, all this has happened, and I remember even way back in the 70s when they were start working on the rancho, and I would take my mom out shopping, and we would drive by on Santa Fe, and she'd point and she'd say, look at there's a rancho where your grandmother used to work. She says, it's where my mother worked all her life, you know, and, and I wish that it would have been open at that time so I could have brought her back. That's one thing I wish all the time, I, that she could have come back and seen what it is now, you know, today. A Luiseno room has been incorporated into the hacienda where local families can put pictures of both their ancestors and of their youngsters. Those honored include Luis Fassat, whose family was influential in the development of nearby Oceanside and who was a frequent visitor to local schools and libraries telling the story of her people. We're working with uh, Jake and he granted us one of the rooms so we have our Luceno artifacts and things in there. And there are nice pictures of my great-great-grandmother in memory of being here and also my family and all my descendants. <laughs> and I bring them here, I make them come every Christmas. <laughs> I tell them, don't forget after Thanksgiving we gotta go to the rancho because they're having their Christmas, you know. And So we come and the kids just love it. They just love it, you know, because all my grandkids, <laughs> they just love coming because they get to, they wander around all day and they get to look at stuff and they just know that this, the heritage of what went on here, you know, they know about it. And, and I hope someday they'll bring their kids and let them see it, you know, and let them be aware. I feel very comfortable when I come here, when I walk here. I feel very comfortable. It's like I can feel my people around me. And when I go to the mission, when, I, when I'm there for powwows or for anything, I feel the same way. It's like this is where I belong or this is where I came from. So there is that feeling, you know, of, and I'm glad I only live like a stone's throw away from the mission because <laughs> when I was uh, younger and I would be outside hanging laundry and diapers and stuff and my little kids would be playing around my feet there with their cars and trucks and stuff, at noontime you could hear the mission bells ring. Just so clear, you know, coming through the valley, you could hear the mission bells ringing. And I don't know, it's just like home. <laughs> Rancho Wahome, a National Historic Landmark at 2210 North Santa Fe Avenue Vista, is open to the public seven days a week from sunrise to sunset, with specific times for tours of the buildings. A $3 donation is expected.
This program was made possible by a generous grant from the Parker Foundation. Gerald and Inez Parker.